All right, here's lesson one four. Today we'll be talking about patterns and functions. And I hope you can hear me well. I've got a bit of a cold, so you'll have to pardon that. And hopefully everything I say comes across kind of clearly. All right, functions should be a new vocab word for you. The technical definition of a function, it's a relationship that assigns exactly one output for each input. So when we're talking about outputs and inputs, usually we look at something like a function table or a relationship. And you guys remember on the from seventh grade that where we have the x and the y axis. Your inputs usually are what's going on the x-axis and your output is going on the y-axis. So a function is a relationship that assigns exactly one output for each input. So for example, I might say you've got a babysitting job and you make $10 an hour. Okay, And if I told you how much would you make if you babysat for two hours, you would say $20. How about five hours? $50. You would know exactly what your output was because there would just be one output each time. That would be a function. If your babysitting rate varied or something like it depended if there were a lot of kids or you know, if you were out past a certain hour or if your parents had to drop you off or if they picked you up, then that might not be a function because I might say, hey, you work for two hours and you might be like, well, sometimes I make 10 and sometimes I make $25. So it might vary. That would not be a function. You can only have exactly one output for each input to be a function. A function rule is an equation that describes a function. So in that example that I gave you before, if you were babysitting for $10 an hour each hour, you could say y, if that's your babysitting, equals 10 times x, if x is your number of hours. That would be a function rule that describes that function. All right, here is a table that we're looking at. We're comparing two variables, the number of apples and the cost. And your job is to try to write a function rule to describe the relationship in the table. So when I ask you to write a function rule, you're going to be trying to look for a pattern between the number of apples and the cost. And I'm going to notice here that every single time it looks like it's 35 cents per apple. So if I call number of apples A and the cost C, it looks like cost is always 35 cents times the number of apples times A. C equals 0.35 times A. That works every time. We're going to look at a little bit more complicated table. And we're first going to look at this little drawing. OK, so here we've got a couple different toothpick patterns that make different triangles. And what I want you to do is compare the term number to the number of toothpicks. Okay, This would be an awesome exercise to try on your own, but I'll talk out through how I do it, but you might want to pause and give it a good effort. Okay, So if I was going to try to figure out how many toothpicks are coming up in the next terms, etc., I'm going to notice, because some people don't know what this, these are the toothpicks. So there's three toothpicks there. Here there are five toothpicks. If I look at term three, it looks like there are seven toothpicks. And I might be able to make a guess. If I go to four, it's going to have like another little upside down triangle. It's going to add two more toothpicks. So that's nine. And I need to try to come up with what's going to happen here when there's ten toothpicks. And you've got a lot of ways to do this. You might notice, hey, the table looks like it's adding 2 every time. So every time I'm going up by 2. And you could just keep adding 2 until you get to the 10. Or you can try to come up with your function rule first and then come up with it. When I'm looking to write a function rule, I'm looking for a pattern. And I might say, Hey, it looks like it's going up by 2 every time, and a lot of people want to guess something like y equals x plus 2, if you call the number of toothpicks y and the term number x. And you have to think, does that work? So here, where I have the 3, y is 3 and x is 1. In that case, y actually is 2 more than x. 3 is 2 more than 1. But here, if I look here, 5 is not 2 more than 2. 
and 7 is not 2 more than 3, so that doesn't work. A good tip might be if every time that something's happening here, you're going up by 2 every time, add 2, add 2, add 2, add 2. I hope you remember from elementary that repeated addition is the same thing in mul as multiplication. So actually a good way to start our function rule might be y equals 2x plus something. And we might have to figure out what we need to add. So then I'm going to look here and I'm going to say y equals 2x plus a number. So in this case, where's y equals 3, x equals 1, 2 times 1 is 2. What do I have to add to get to 3? I have to add one more. How about in the, th the 4? 2 times 4 is 8. What do I have to do to get to 9? I have to add one more. It looks like every time if I multiply x by 2 and add 1, I get the number of toothpicks. So a it's probable that my equation is y equals 2x plus 1. If I use this rule to figure out what 10 is, I can just do 2 times 10 is 20 plus 1 and get 21. And that's my equation and my table all solved in one step, a couple steps. Okay, some vocab that you're going to be responsible for knowing. Domain, that's just all the possible values for the input or the independent variable, also known as x every value that x could possibly be. That's called your domain. The range is all the possible values for the output or the dependent variable, every single number or every single quantity that y could be. We'll look at some examples to help you put that together. Okay, so here's example three. Suppose you want to find out how much gas a trip will take in a car that uses one gallon of gas to go about 18 miles. What are the independent quantity and the dependent quantity? So you're figuring out from seventh grade, okay, what does independent and dependent mean? Dependent is the one that depends on the first thing. So usually I think we would say that the miles that you can go depends on how much gas you have. So I'm going to say in this case, my independent quantity is the gallons of gas. And my dependent quantity, because it depends on how much gas we have, the dependent quantity in this case is going to be the number of miles that you can travel. And so usually if we were to graph this, x or our gallon of gas would go on the x-axis and our dependent or our number of miles would go on the y-axis. And when we're dealing with domain and range, our domain would go with all my x values and my range would go with all the y values. Okay, here's a similar problem that's going to be a little bit more complicated. Here we have Ken, Ken and Barbie. They're biking along and Ken is going, you know, at a decent clip. So he's burning 425 calories per hour when he bikes. Every weekend he bikes from three to seven hours. This problem, we, I'm giving you two tasks to do. You need to identify what the quantity is independent and which one's dependent. And then we're also going to talk about how to find reasonable domain and range values. So here we go, in this problem, I need to see which two quantities am I comparing. It looks like I'm comparing calories that he burns to hours that he bikes. So ask yourself, which one depends on the other one? I think the calories that he burns depends on how many hours he bikes. So if I'm looking here, I'm going to say that the hours biked that's going to be my independent quantity and the, the calories burned, that's my dependent. Okay. And I like to look at this when I'm trying to figure out my domain and range. I like to put it right with the one that it goes with. So I know that my domain goes with my hours biked because that's independent. And my range is going to go with these calories burned because that's dependent. When you're trying to figure out what would be a reasonable domain value, you have to think, what are all the quantities or what are all the numbers that could possibly fall under the hours biked category? So we can see from the problem above 
that it looks like there's going to be, he can always bike in between three and seven hours. So he's always going to bike from three to seven hours. So we'd say that the hours biked, the domain, is anywhere from three to seven, and that's in hours. A range, we want to see what are all the possible values for calories that he could have burned. So I like to think about it as this. What's the smallest number of calories he could burn? Well, we know he burns 425 calories per hour, and he's going to bike at least three hours. So if I do 425 times three, that would give me my smallest amount of calories that I could burn or that Ken could burn. So 1,275 is the smallest reasonable domain value, reasonable range value, sorry. 1,275 is the smallest. Now, if he has the most, he would still do 425 calories per hour, but seven hours each weekend, so we just do 425 times seven. And if we do 425 times seven, we find that the most calories he'd burn from biking in a weekend is 2,975. So the reasonable range, everything that could happen for calories, is from 1,275 to 2,975. Okay, I want you, I think this is a really tough topic for a lot of people. So I've given you some three problems here at the end that I want you to try on your own. And then come back and check the answer. So I'll show them all at once. And try to read them on your screen and solve them, and I am going to work out the answers. So pause this, do your best. Okay, number one. Write a function rule for the relationship between the number of hours input and the number of miles output. So I'm going to call hours H and miles M, and I'm trying to figure out the relationship between miles and hours. It looks like Every time I'm going 60 times as many miles as I am hours. So it looks like my miles equals 60 times the number of hours, or m equals 60 h. If you, if you got that, you did a great job. Okay, number two, the cooking time for an unstuffed turkey is about 20 minutes per pound. What are the independent quantity and the dependent quantity for this situation? Okay, so we have to see what two things are you comparing. It looks like I'm comparing cooking time and the amount of pounds a turkey is. And I have to say what depends on the other. Looks like in this situation that we have to cook depending on the number of pounds. So the cooking time is dependent on the number of pounds. Therefore, a number of pounds is my independent quantity. And my independent <laughs> and the cooking time is going to be my dependent and then the very last problem here Charlie downloads songs for 75 cents each he has between three dollars and six dollars to spend on songs identify the independent and dependent quantity for this situation and find reasonable domain and range values Okay, this, this problem, I think it's actually a little ambiguous. I probably should have picked a better example. Uh, I think a case can be made either way for independent and dependent, as long as you're comparing the money he has to spend and the songs downloaded. Okay, and I know he's downloading songs for 75 cents each, and he has between $3 and $6 to spend. So it seems to me that... In this case, the money is what's controlling the situation. He can't buy more songs than he has money for. So it seems to me that his money is the independent and the number of songs he can buy depends on how much money he has. Okay, but you really can make a case for the other way as long as you're explaining it well. Um, in this case, the money, it can be our domain, because that's independent. So that would be anywhere from three to six, because that's how much money he has. And the number of songs is dependent, so that's our range. If he has three dollars and there's 75 cents each, he can buy four songs at minimum. And at max, with six, six songs, um, six dollars, he's going to have eight songs. So that would be my range. Okay, thanks and good luck.